Hi, and welcome to The Shit That Happens To Me, a podcast about life, love, and everything in between. I'm your host, Stacey Nye, psychologist, passionate storyteller, wife, mother, wannabe famous person. Now sit back and listen, because I'm here to tell you about The Shit That Happens To Me. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Shit That Happens To Me podcast. I'm so excited about my guest today, my second video guest, which is Imogen Church. Hi, Imogen. Hi, Stace. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Very good, considering the plague. Oh, Fun. right. The plague. Yeah, it's just that. <laughs> I'm so excited to have you back with us. Um, I really enjoyed talking to you the first time, and I know we're going to have a lot of fun talking this time. So, well, you hope so. You hope so. I hope so. I hope, I hope, I hope you will be entertaining. <laughs> I know. I hope you won't disappoint me. I'm <laughs> Why not to? So first, I, this wasn't a question I had on my list of questions, but my first question is, tell me about that necklace you're wearing. Oh, the necklace. So this is from a company called Tatty Divine, and I am, I am useless in the face of their purchases. They absolutely rinse me. So they make these the acrylic, kind of acrylic wearable pieces of art. Yeah. And it, as you can tell, it's an enormous fairground yeah. arrow. But I have it's other so things. Fun. I have a flower. I have a thistle. I've got all sorts. I love what they do. So, yeah. Well, and, you know, if everyone, you all should follow Imogen on social media because every day she posts something fun and then she's all usually wearing some fun piece of jewelry <laughs> or clothing or something like that. So, There's always yeah, a yeah. jumpsuit. <laughs> I love it. So you're in the UK right now. So I am. Indeed. We are recording across the, yeah. Continents. I don't know. Is that the right thing to say? We've gone know. over the ocean. We've crossed yeah. a continent, an island. Yeah. Yeah. So I really appreciate your time. And um, the last time you were here, you talked about your um, experience. So you're, let me back up. You're a narrator. You I narrate am. I audiobooks. audiobooks. I've narrated just hundreds of audiobooks. I love it. And you might remember that um, I had you come on the first time because I I was rather, you're my favorite narrator. Yes. And so I reached out <laughs> yeah, and was like, hey, you want to be on my podcast? And you were like, sure. And I didn't even know at the time that you had this very interesting life before you were a narrator, which you were a burlesque dancer. So you told us all about that in your previous episode called Burlesque. So that was really fun listening to that. And so how many years were you, ha have you been a narrator? Um, so I started narrating audiobooks about 10 years ago. Um, I grew up listening to audiobooks. So I have loved them since I was a kid. I used to listen to them going to sleep. It kind of helped me to learn how to read. So audiobooks were always a really big part of my life. And then I found myself kind of at a loose end. I was studying for a master's degree, but there wasn't really much happening other than that. And I thought, oh, I wonder if I could volunteer to narrate audiobooks for the blind. So I got in touch with the Royal National Institute for the Blind in uh -huh. London and said, can I, can I read books for you? <laughs> and they said, come in and do an audition tape and we'll see if you're right for it. And I came in and read and they were like, well, there's a lot of kind of middle class white girls, you know, it's, it's not exactly a USP until the point I happened to mention that I had done burlesque, <laughs> at which point they got really excited and went, ooh, 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 would you narrate erotica? Wait, I didn't know this. <laughs> Oh my goodness. In my life I could film many <laughs> podcasts. So I said, yeah, sure. I mean, as long as it's not <laughs> like deeply offensive, I will happily read boobs, butts, all of it. Uh -huh. um, so then I was straight in the door. I was narrating Mills and Boone novels, <laughs> you know, left, right and center. Um, the thing about the RNIB 
is they have a policy that only two registered blind people have to request a certain book and then they have to make a recording of it. So there were these two gentlemen. <laughs> oh, no. Wait, so this was erotica for the blind? Yeah, erotica for the blind. Oh. These two gentlemen would get together and say, well, hang on. All we have to do is agree on what book we're going to request and they have to make it. So there was there was quite a lot of erotica to chew through. Wow. <laughs> and it turned out. So that was kind of where I learned the craft of it. Yeah. And um, it just turned out I was really good at it. It was just something that I'm, I'm built for. I have really good sight reading skills. I love reading. I can read for hours and hours and hours. Um, and I'm really good at voices and accents. So it's kind of all those things together put me in the perfect place to be good at narrating audiobooks. And once I'd started doing stuff for them, uh -huh. um, this was around about the time Fifty Shades of Grey came out. And so all the big publishers started to panic and go, oh, God, we've got to publish some erotica and we need some sexy books on our list. But, you know, a lot of the actors they were using to narrate... I assume we're not keen on narrating audio porn. I had no problem with it. So they would phone up the RNIB and say, oh, so who are we going to get to read our erotic audio books? And they'd say, well, we have someone. you've got to meet Imogen. <laughs> and so once I, once I was kind of in the door with some of the big commercial publishers, they went, oh, you're good at this. Can you do stuff that isn't sexy? Yeah, right. <laughs> I went, yeah, pretty sure I can. <laughs> and it just snowballed from there so yeah it's been crazy and so much fun I love it so um and you were just recently nominated for um an award an Audi award is that what it's called yeah it's like the big kahuna it's a yes. big deal it's like yes. the Oscars of audiobooks and I was up for like best actress <laughs> it was amazing you were. you were up for the Ruth Ware book one by one which of course I listened to Yes, a lot of people listen to the Ruth Wares. Yes, well, they're so much fun to listen to. They're, you know, mysteries and they immediately, you know, capture your attention. And it didn't even occur. And you you narrate a lot of mysteries. It didn't even occur to me that you might narrate books that aren't mysteries because I only listen to mysteries. <laughs> yeah, I do a lot of comedy as well. I love comedy books. Um, a lot of thrillers mysteries and then occasionally you get random interesting things uh, factual books I, I narrated a book last year called women in the kitchen that was a history of women cookbook writers yeah. and this cookbook historian had plucked out various women from the very first woman to write a cookbook to present day just she just picked a selection because there are so many yeah. and I got to read about the history of this woman and then read some of her favorite recipes and that was fascinating oh, and I'm boy. prepping one at the moment on anthropology it's just it's just wonderful it's such a great job to have oh I bet yeah it sounds like a lot of fun and certainly you know you know, I, I mean, I enjoy listening, you know, to your books. I listen to a lot of audio books and, um, yeah. Where do you listen? Where and when? Like, where am I when I listen? Mm. Well, so it used to be in the car primarily, but since I'm not in the car so much anymore, I listen when I'm cooking or doing laundry or doing dishes or sometimes I'll listen, like I'll take my dogs outside and I'll listen. So I might be like just walking down the street and I, if I'm just going out for a few minutes, I don't have my headphones on. So there'll be like some scene, like someone's being like bludgeoned to death and someone will walk by me, you know, on the other side of the street. And I don't always get, to, I don't always turn it off in time. And people like give me strange looks like, what, what, what is happening here? So... Well, I listen to, I listen to, Audible kept giving me free credits and so I would listen to these books and eventually I got hooked and just went, oh no, I need to be a punter as well. So I listen every day when I'm walking my dog oh, and yeah. quite often I'm laughing out loud, I'm sobbing yeah. and other people are walking past me thinking this woman is legitimately crazy. What's your favourite thing to listen to? I... 
weirdly, maybe it's because obviously I work narrating so much fiction. I read fiction all day long, pretty much. So I really like autobiographies. Mm. I find them really fascinating, particularly if they're written by someone funny. I like yeah. reading. I just did Amy Schumer's The Girl yeah. with the Lower Back Tattoo, which I loved. Yeah, and actually funny. it made me cry as well. But I'm currently on Michelle Obama's book. I just yeah sob every chapter there's right. so much in it that is so fantastic so yeah I'm, I'm kind of really into um comic autobiographies or interesting fact books just because I read fiction basically all day every day right. and before I go to sleep so sure. I, I'd also recommend Tina Fey's book Bossy Pants done it yeah, Done it. They narrate. So I love it when they narrate themselves. Yeah, yeah, it's fabulous. It's fabulous. Although, as we know, some people who've written books are better at narrating them yeah, than others. Sure. Yeah. If they're a performer, they're quite often good. And actually, right. Michelle Obama does a stand-up job. Yeah, I bet, yeah. Thanks. So now, um, so you then you you did something very interesting, and you told us about this last time. At the very end, you were like, "Oh, and there's kind of a surprise around the corner." Um, so you wrote your own book. I did, <laughs> and and this book is called um, "Death and the Burlesque Maiden." So um, tell us all about this book, like the title of it, what it's about. I have a hundred questions about the book. <laughs> so. I've always written as well. I wrote from the age of about 20. So I've been writing for about 20 years. Um, but I'd always really written screenplays, so dramas, theatre plays, screenplays, things like that, because that's my background. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not that au fait with prose, although I had tried to write a novel previously. It was okay. It was, you know, it was all right. It was kind of dipping my toe in. And then Audible approached me and said we've heard you can write would you like to write your own novel you, that you then narrate wow and I kind of went uh yes can I bet your hand off please yeah. um so we arranged to have a meeting I felt like a proper writer I was being taken out to lunch so I went on the train down to London I went to the restaurant and said oh hi we have a table booked for midday myself and so and so from audible and they went yeah no you don't and I went, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, what? And they went, yeah, no, there's no reservation. So I phoned the lovely woman, Harriet at Audible, who, who was part of the commissioning team to ask me to do it. And she went, yeah, you're a month early. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's some shit that happened to you before you even started <laughs> writing the book. Lucky, right? A month early. Oh. Luckily, so it was Harriet and Robin who yeah. were going to be in charge of commissioning this book for me. Robin was in a meeting, bless him, but Harriet was like, do you know what? I was just going to have a sandwich. I'll put around the corner and we'll have lunch. Oh, nice. <laughs> so thankfully, she turned up. We ate pizza and I had come up with maybe six ideas. I thought I've got to go in there fully prepared. I'd come up with six ideas for books that I could pitch to her. I didn't get past the first one, which was, it's a comedy crime caper set in a burlesque club. I and know. she instantly went, yeah, no, that's that's it. That's the yeah. one I want. Right, right. Um, <laughs> so uh, obviously I wanted to utilise my experiences in burlesque. And I thought it would be fun to be able to actually reproduce some of the routines I used to do. So as I'm sure we discussed on the last podcast, my routines were like a mixture of satirical comic poetry yeah. followed by striptease. So I thought, well, we can one of my main characters can be a version of me and she can perform these routines. Yeah. Um, so that was just a nice little touch that I thought would kind of link it to my real experience. Um, but they had said they would like it to be a crime novel. And I kind of went, OK, you know, I can I can I can do crime. <laughs> But I did say to them, I said, there's no point me trying to squeeze myself into that really familiar crime novel genre that I narrate hundreds of books like that. You know, they have a kind of monochrome cover. They're called, I don't know, The Shelter by the Sea or The Lost Corpse. And... And there's always a picture of a kind of desolate landscape or, or a, a children's toy. 
I love those books, but that's not really me. So I said, I will make it crime, but it will be crime Imogen style. <laughs> so it had to be, for me, black comedy, satirical. And as I started plotting it out and trying to come up with the ideas, I was like, it doesn't even take place in this world. Hopefully they're not going to sack me. So I had this kind of alternate version of London called Megalopolis. Yeah, that right. was set in a kind of stuck in an almost kind of 1930s feel, but it had a steampunk aspect to it um, so that everything was just slightly off. You know, there was no way you would think, oh, OK, this is definitely London. Everything was just slightly off. The, the tech is slightly different and the way, you know, all the lights are hand cranked or you have to charge batteries by pedaling on a bike. It's just everything like that to give it enough separation that people could buy into it as this piece of entertainment. Right. And also part of that was I didn't want it to be the cathartic feel of a thriller either, mm -hmm. which isn't to say I don't love that because I do. But I didn't want it to be about the catharsis of feeling the fear and then feeling disgusted. And then, yes, I've solved the crime. I just wanted it to be about ideas, really, which is why I made one of the characters the narrator. Yes. So I was going to ask you about that because you do pop in. <laughs> as the Now, it's, we say that two different ways. I put the emphasis on the first syllable, narrator. You put the emphasis mm -hmm. on the second syllable. I like the way you say it much better. But um, <laughs> you pop in as the narrator um, yes, well, a few times, which is really fun. So tell me about that. What made you decide to do that? Well, one of my favorite, favorite books of all time is Cold Comfort Farm by Stella Gibbons. Okay. I don't know if you've read it. No. If you haven't, you've got to read it. It was okay, written in the nineteen. <laughs> it was written in the nineteen thirties, and again, it's a satire. It's kind of a parody of pastoral novels, a bit like D. H. Lawrence, who were writing really Thomas Hardy writing really grim pastoral novels from you know involving poverty and misery and death. Anyway, Stella Gibbons um, writes this really fun, eccentric comedy about a London society girl who ends up having to go and live on this really muddy, shitty farm in the middle of nowhere. And it's about her trying to fit in and finding a purpose for her life there and learning not to be so prissy. But at the beginning of the book, in the introduction, <laughs> Stella Gibbons, I just couldn't believe it when I read it. She she writes this introduction a bit like my narrator. So it's her, but it's it's also not her. It's a bit tongue in cheek. She writes in the introduction that she's going to help the critics out by when she gets to a really good sentence that she's written. She's just going to put a couple of asterisks by it. <laughs> so that the reviewers don't have to read the whole book. They can just go to the really good chapter, the really good sentences, pluck those out and write the review based on that. Yeah. So at various <laughs> points during the book, you come across like a really flowery, slightly pretentious sentence. And then she's put a couple of asterisks to say, aren't I clever? And I just... I loved that. It means that all the way through the book, she keeps plucking you out and reminding you yeah. that it's entertainment and it's comedy and it's a story. Right. And I just really wanted to do that. So that was my version of it. That was my homage to Gibbons by having the narrator pop in occasionally and go, oh, hello, you. Welcome back. It's all yeah. right, this book, isn't it? It's not great, but it's not terrible. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> I think that's, it. you know, it really lets the reader, it's like when on SNL, when they like look at the camera and start laughing or yeah, something, exactly. it like, lets you feel like you're in on something. Yes. So readers yeah. love that. Yeah. So yeah, that was, that really was the idea. And I enjoyed that a couple of people told me that the narrator was their favorite character. Right. right. <laughs> well, so... You did base one of the characters on your on yourself, or more mm. than one, or well, in some ways, you know, I'm in all of them. Yes, right. <laughs> Nora, Nora Bunn struggle 
is probably the most although still loosely based on me and she's the one I gave my routines to so her yeah. burlesque routines are poetry and striptease yeah and I felt really like um an insider when I recognized the routines from what you had told me you had done I was like oh yeah I know that Imogen did that, <laughs> so that yeah you know write what you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it's very it's really interesting that audible that the original plan wasn't for it to be a mystery and that um audible wanted you to put some crime in there so that's i think i mean i i suspect it's it's just business isn't it i think crime sells so well crime yeah. is so popular and also i'm known really well for narrating mystery and crime yeah. so i suspect it's you know a business case of okay if we get a narrator to write their own book and narrate it but it needs to fall into the right category yeah. you know i could have turned around and said i would like to write a fiction a fact book about the history of the pygmy people and they would have gone, yeah, probably not. Yeah, I might um, not read that one, Imogen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Nothing against the pygmy people, but. Yeah, well, absolutely. But I know nothing about them. So that right, would have been right. a bit of a left field call. Yeah. So, yeah. So the title, I mean, was that um, an easy thing for you to come up with? Or did you labor over that title? Uh, no, it just came to me in the middle of the night. Um, oh, I love a pun. I'm terrible. <laughs> I just love a, I love a play on words. Again, it kind of implies that maybe it's not taking itself too seriously. I just heard death and the maiden. And then I thought death, it begins with death, death and the burlesque maiden, which is hilarious because obviously none of them are maidenly at all. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I just wanted it to be a play on that, really. Yeah. And the artwork is really um, beautiful. It's so tell me about the artwork that you had done for it. Well, that's that was completely out of my hands. And there was oh. a, a period where I thought, oh, God, what if it comes back and it's totally wrong? You know, what if they asked for a crime novel? I kind of gave them a crime novel, but not really and what if they try and shoehorn it into the you know what if it's a monochrome cover with you know a child sandal washed up on the beach <laughs> right but no and look what my friends have made for me oh, oh. hang on Where are we look at that so when that turned up when i got the email that said all oh, the art department because that's you know it's nothing to do with me it's just the art department i guess yeah. someone reads it or reads the blurb and then decides that turned up and I thought oh I love it it's it so seems to cool. encapsulate everything about it you know it's dark it's noir -y, it's kind of Bauhaus and it's, it's got that animated yeah, yeah exactly it's, it's so. really great it's really great <laughs> I love it and she looks a bit like oh god it's gone I've got COVID brain or COVID <laughs> Brian as I said to someone once <laughs> Oh, you know, Betty, no, no, it's gone. It's gone. Oh, okay. Stacey, is there a name for this in your profession? Your <laughs> COVID brain. I, that works. That works. Betty Page. Betty Page. Oh, yes. She's got okay. the blunt fringe, the yeah. rosebud lips. Mm -hmm. Is there a name for COVID brain yet? Is it in the DSM? No, it's not in the DSM. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> There needs to be a whole chapter in the DSM for, you know, COVID pandemic related illnesses. I but, think so. I yeah. think so. Um, okay. So you sing this song <laughs> in the book. <laughs> oh, we should have really seen you bop that, you know, water <laughs> out across the screen. You sing this song um in called everybody smile because we're all going to die and it's this very like do 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 song with this very dark dark message so please tell me about this song so this song was also plucked from my career in cabaret okay um but 
that song was originally sung by another character who I used to perform as, but not striptease. This was, she used to host cabarets and she would perform poetry was also her thing, but without stripping. So her name was Regina Fluff. And she was a disgraced children's poet laureate who had been struck off and blacklisted in like 83 countries when she exposed herself on Radio 4. She is a gin fiend and she writes really offensive poems for children. Like the kind, of, <laughs> the kind of stuff that you just shouldn't, you shouldn't let her near kids. Um, so after being um, struck off as the children's poet laureate, she turns to even more booze and works the cabaret club circuit. So she comes out, I'm wondering if I have a picture, but I don't think I do. I actually put a book of her poems on Amazon to raise money for charity. Oh, okay. um, so you can get a book of her poems with my scratchy little illustrations. She comes out in a red and white candy striped dress with pigtails and glitter, but her makeup's all smudged and she's got like balloons and loo paper attached to her leg. She's wearing boots and ripped tights and she comes out with a drink of gin and reads poems to children that are actually really frightening or offensive. But in her head, in her head, she's just teaching them life lessons. Mm -hmm. She's whipping them for the world to come. The fact that they're four doesn't matter to her. She's doing a public service. Okay. So <laughs> I did a, this sprawling cabaret um, about 10 years ago in an art centre and Regina did some of her poems which was great and then I wanted something else to add to it so I gave her a sock puppet I can't even remember what name I gave him but anyway she had this sock puppet that was also really crappily made um, and she came out and did a song and I wrote this song um, a friend of mine actually came up with the idea for the title and went oh you could do a song called everybody smile because we're all gonna die and I went, I think she was joking, but I wasn't. Yeah. So I wrote this entire song and I wrote it out on big placards and I took it out in the centre of this cabaret and made the audience sing along with me. Oh, Everybody smile because we're all going to die. Yeah. So you and wrote the song I wrote for the Regina. Uh -huh. For Regina, but the song that Regina isn't in the book, there wasn't room for her. She deserves her own book. Yeah. Um, but I wrote the song and Audible, for their original stuff, I think they quite often like to come up with a theme tune, you know, just give it that little extra kind of pizzazz. So they, I mean, they hired proper composers to add the instrumental that you hear in there. You know, I just sung it a cappella in a slightly rubbish voice, but they hired, you know, a Soho composing studio to come up with the, with the, um, with the musical accompaniment. And we discussed influences. That's my dog. Sorry. Yeah, that's we discussed okay. influences and we discussed, you know, who did it want it? Who did I want it to sound like the music? I said, it's got to sound like a, like a pub song, but also a bit like the Dresden Dolls. He's just barking because someone's getting a delivery. Yeah, it's probably not okay. for me, although yeah. it might be another jumpsuit. <laughs> um, oh, oh, is it for me? No, it's not. It's for next not time. For you. Okay. <laughs> anyway, my dog is is a psychopath. He will defend this house against any stranger yeah that's their job i mean oh, no. it's oh, really no. their job i i don't want my dogs barking but i realize this is their job <laughs> yeah oh. but it's yeah. loud I like it. I like it. right um where were we oh you were telling me about you know the, the pub song and you know so oh, yeah so, they yeah, so they hired job. these proper proper composers to, to come up with the the um instrumental for my you know lo-fi little cabaret song yeah. and then they used that as the music at the beginning and then at the end of the book 
which yeah. I loved. I thought that was great. Yeah. It was really, um, really fun. So I think I was probably out walking one day when that song started playing. You know, <laughs> the neighbors walking by, like, what are you listening to, woman? Um, so what kind of shit happened to you in the process of writing the book? Um, first of all, not shit at all. I said to my family, look, I really feel that I need, just for like planning it, I need to go and stay in a hotel for a couple of days. Um, <laughs> so I said, I just, I think to break the back of it, I'm going to have to go and stay in like a five star hotel. <laughs> Um, so I went away to this really lovely hotel near us and stayed two nights, I think. And you know what? It was the best thing. I mean, obviously it was the best thing because I got to go and stay in a hotel. But having that just, I just sat from sun up to sundown working on it and trying to work out what the shape of it was and what the tone of it was. And once you've done that, you've kind of broken the back of it that way, the rest of it is a lot easier. But I mean, for any piece of writing, not just a novel, but for all the screenplays I've written for everything, the best piece of advice I can give is that you have to plot it to death. Yeah. You've got to plot it out until you cannot plot it anymore. I mean, I'm starting, I'm writing a new screenplay at the moment and I have every single scene plotted out so that I know what the point of the scene is and if there's no point don't write it how it moves the story forward which characters are involved and what their purpose is in the scene and therefore what the whole overall shape of it is and so now the process with writing the screenplay is just sitting down and having fun because i know exactly what's going to happen oh, so that was some good shit that happened okay good <laughs> um other than that it was just a lot of trying to divvy up time when you have a really busy job. I told myself I'd take on less audiobooks to give me time to write it. I didn't because I'm terrible at saying no. Um, and my husband was doing a degree on top of his full time job, and we have kids. So it was just the work of trying to divvy up. You have Saturday go into the city, find a coffee shop and just work. You have Sunday. We'll take the slack over here. It's a lot of work. Yeah, a book's a lot sure. of work. Is there, is there a difference between writing a book that, so it's never going to be published in print? Is that true? Is when Not by the audio book? Yeah. So the, the point is it's exclusive to them. I think after a certain period of time, if I want to, I can chase like actual print. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that depends on whether I can be bothered. <laughs> but do you think that that's writing up? Is it is the writing job different when it's not when it goes when it's meant to be read rather than meant for the page? Yeah, I think it is, and that was partly why I was so interested because my experience has always has always been in writing you know, drama, so yeah. comedy or um, screenplay, sit plays, that kind of stuff. So for me, it felt like, oh, this is a good kind of halfway house. Yeah. So I can utilize the stuff I know from writing scenes. Yes, that's right. You always write things meant to be performed. Yeah, exactly. I yeah. mean, the, the, the part of the narrator, I still would have done it, but I probably would have framed it slightly differently. It would be, meanwhile, a note from the writer, right. you know, as opposed to, hi, guys. Hi, it's the narrator. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there would have been different aspects to it, I think. I might not also have written scenes in first person. So all of the book is different chapters um, narrated first person by various characters. If it wasn't straight for audio, specifically for audio, I might not have done that. I might have written the whole thing third person. Yeah. I'm not sure. But yeah, it's definitely, having said that, I did not think enough about having to read it out loud. <laughs> because when I came really? to read it out loud, I went, oh my God. I've got to be eight different people first person narrating, yes, yes, yes. including like a, a eight year old boy, yep. a geriatric person, 
um <laughs> it was a lot of work it was hard <laughs> and i had sentences i couldn't believe i'd actually written this and not it hadn't even occurred to me i had to say it out loud in one chapter i had the sentence <laughs> it the bathroom contained incongruous linoleum oh uh-huh <laughs> oh, how stupid is that i know one of the uh, one of the hard and fast rules of audio is that no one can say linoleum first time <laughs> let alone incongruous linoleum yeah but you <laughs> so, yeah, i probably could have gone easier on myself in fact the the editor when she came back with her first pass of notes said are you are you sure you want <laughs> To you say incongruous linoleum? Do so much first person narration. Oh. The other thing I found interesting with the editing process was A, how much better they make you look as a writer. Thank you. And B, the f after the first part, she kind of said, you can write more. Like I'd actually kind of underwritten it in terms of world building and stuff like that. And I think that comes from writing screenplays where you want as few words as possible mm. you want to you want your page to be mostly white paper and to say what you want to say in as few words as you possibly can oh huh. I didn't know so that. she kind of gave me permission to go back and lean into it a bit more and you know and enjoy some of the descriptions more and yeah just build the world more which was nice because I, I i think probably it's more common for people to need to cut back yeah right and to actually have underplayed it right. and people, then people yeah. yeah like i've i've heard like stephen king speak and you know he his books are so freaking long and um he you know I mean, has he's to just cut a back. Genius. yeah i love his books but his book on writing is yes. one of the best things i've ever read about writing i yeah. mean it's like read it every couple of years because it's so good it's so good yeah mm. for sure i think i toyed with the idea of writing a book that i just never did but um this is this is much better for me to just <laughs> you like the chatter you I like, like the chatter yeah face -to -face. i like to write i like to write but yeah this is better <laughs> <laughs> Um, so do you know that, um, so I, I took a look at your ratings. Oh no, no, never book. do that. Never I do that. that. <laughs> well, they're like amazing. You have like a 4.9 out of five. What? No, stop it. Do you, you know do. what? I... <laughs> you so, do. Because, because of the pandemic, right. So they paid me all this money to write this book and I thought okay well I took the bulk of it and I booked us my family on a, a cruise around the Norwegian fjords Aww. which is awesome. what a lovely thing to do with you know like a lump of money that comes in yeah. that you weren't expecting which obviously we've now had to postpone till 2022 but I thought to myself well I'm gonna also set by a chunk of money and have a massive party and I'm going to invite anyone who can make it and I'm going to, the bar's going to be open. Thanks, COVID. Yeah, How right. selfish. How yeah, selfish. I know. So I thought instead, what can I possibly do to celebrate? I thought I'll have this review writing competition. Yes. So, you know, on my publishing day, I bought this outrageously expensive disco ball of a dress, which is a work of art in itself. And I thought I'll do a live Instagram to launch this competition. People can write creative, lovely, fun reviews. And the ones that I like the most, I'll give them a prize Yeah. and uh, send them off. Little did I realise that would mean that sometimes I would have to go to the review page because a few <laughs> people said, oh, I don't know how to send it to you. Can It's on the review page. Right. Oh my lord! So th this was the shit that happened to me. Oh, I did not like that at all. I did not like that at all. Loads of people love it, but yeah. wow, some people really hated it. <laughs> really? Oh, I didn't see any of those. Reviews. Not many, and I no, think they're probably okay. in the UK. But okay. a couple of, I'm guessing from the names, middle-aged white dudes <laughs> did not like it at all. Terrible. 
worst thing I've ever read. Had to switch it off after 10 yeah. minutes. And I, oh my God, I couldn't, I couldn't bear it. Well, I agree. So I've done like some, you know, public speaking and um, read all of my evaluations. And that's just painful because. It's awful, isn't it? Yeah. Oh yeah. Like I did a. I'll never forget this. And this might have been 20 years ago. I did a very personal, you know, presentation. There were probably, you know, 150 people in the room. And I got probably 100 really excellent reviews. Mm -hmm. And I got two that were really bad and painful. And I'll never forget what those people wrote. Right. <laughs> a hundred people. Yeah, yeah, you said you yeah. could, oh, we forget those. Those yeah. don't matter. Somehow in my head, those are all, they're fake or they're biased or they're this or they're nice. that. But yeah. the two people that really yeah. hated you, right. they're wrong somehow in our heads. Yeah. And then I had to be told, don't read those But um, <laughs> anymore. But I did want to... I just wanted to like tell you about some of the because people wrote really fun stuff the good ones um like someone wrote like this is delicious delicious the word delicious came up a couple of times oh, i love yeah. that uh well one of them said this is delicious and depraved you know that's like a positive <laughs> review <laughs> um, perfect one said burlesque masterpiece that was my review actually <laughs> And I won a review award. I didn't even know. I thought I got my review in too late. Yeah, I got my bookmark. Here it is. Thank you so much. With that lovely phrase, everybody smile because we're all going to die. So there's my bookmark. And um, one person um, wrote, um, please start your second novel. Oh, God. So that's oh, God. My questions. And Papa Pasty is what what she wrote on there so <laughs> can you explain what that means to pop a pasty so um the coverings that burlesque girls wear on their nipples are called pasties yes so if they have a tassel it's more common to call it a nipple tassel oh. but lots of girls just wear um you know like a kind of a disc to yeah. cover the nipple yeah. um and that is called a pasty and they will glue that on or tape it on. Yeah. I remember I did a show in Seattle where I forgot mine. Oh. <laughs> um, and I had whipped cream as part of the routine. And I thought, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I've got a great idea. I've forgotten my nipple tassels, my pasties. So I would turn and remove my bra with my back to the audience. So I thought, well, while I'm doing that, I'll get the whipped cream, spray it over my nipples so that when I turn around, it's like whipped cream. Yeah. Problem was, it was really hot. Yeah, under the it lights. Really yeah. hot. And I must have been really hot because I put the cream on, like creamy boobs. Yeah. Just slid right off. Right. Yeah. So I turned round and just went, this is how we do it in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> so is, is this person suggesting that um, you would pop a pasty like in, I, I was just trying to figure out like, did she want you to title the book that or that you would, that <laughs> no, would happen? I think she's probably referring to, particularly if somebody is wearing nipple tassels and they want to twirl them, sometimes, as with the start of my book, they talk about this, yeah. it pops off. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so it is not uncommon yeah. for a pasty to pop off yeah. and I someone in the audience to steal it, which is rude. Yes, that would be rude. <laughs> <That's the tears. laughs> so, so, yeah okay second second i mean in my head yeah. i blame harriet who was part of the team that commissioned the book she was like oh my god it could be a series of them solving crimes yes so in my head there is a three book arc um i don't know if they will ask me back for book two i don't know if i if i i certainly haven't got it in me to write it yet yeah. but i need a bit of a breather that's why i went right i'm gonna go and write a screenplay put some put some space between cleanse me and your me. palette yeah yeah <laughs> exactly although actually that was one review i saw that i loved where a guy said 
do you know what this is so refreshing for a crime novel it's like the perfect palate cleanser between something really gruesome you come to this you've still got the crime and the mystery to solve but it's fun and silly and yeah you know so that was lovely I thought that was really nice <laughs> yeah that would be so fun um and you and you you know you kind of set it up where they could totally go on and solve mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. crimes you know because there are all sorts of uh there are things that still need to be solved for the three main women and there are skeletons in their closet that will come back to haunt them yeah and hunt them <laughs> so yeah there's definitely the potential there it's... so so harriet get on that you <laughs> no harriet had... left <laughs> harriet got headhunted by another publisher and left oh. which is another reason that i'm just putting it out there they might not commission a second one oh. but this okay. is another this is another um issue that i guess people don't talk about so much in publishing is that you know when someone leaves i suppose the same as if you're an actor with an agent when your if your agent leaves and moves on you've lost your advocate so if your advocate leaves do you just get lost you know yeah. do they does the next person in the door think that your work is any good they might not you know they might think it was a big mistake and not want to commission any more work so you're kind of in in the hands of the gods in that sense but i've yeah, always written and i will always write and I actually, I recently had a good idea, which I say it was a good idea, who knows, which was to take some of the screenplays I've written, because obviously a screenplay is a massive ask to get made. I'm really, really close, really close to having one made right now, oh. but then COVID hit. So oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm still everything crossed. But I thought to myself, I have all these stories that I've already written. Maybe I could turn them into novels. So do it the other way around, you know, I've written them all the stories out as scripts and maybe now because I have the entire story there sitting around, um, I could turn those into novels as well. So I've got lots of ideas. Yeah. Um, but yeah, time will tell. <laughs> I'm actually um, going to be watching a play this weekend over <gasps> like a streamed play. Oh, lovely. I've not done that yet. Have, yeah. Will this be your first one? No, I actually <laughs> watched one that was very silly and not very good, but um, it was something to do. <laughs> and this one has like real actors like that I like know. So I think they're actually performing it in California. Amazing. Um, and then they have the ability to stream it so people can watch it anywhere also so i mean this is a yeah. wonderful you know there are some weird good side effects like sure. um on april the 24th i'm a panelist at the newburyport literary festival oh, that never nice. would have happened before because they weren't used to streaming you know i wouldn't yes. have just suddenly appeared at a festival in the states mm -hmm. whereas now because everyone's online i can yeah. pop up and be a panelist which yeah. is amazing so you know there's some interesting sides to it and i do think i think that theater i don't know about in the us but i imagine it's similar to in the uk it has always been prohibitively expensive and it does make it quite an elitist occupation sure so if they need to reconfigure their business models to be able to house people in-house but also to make it available to people across the world, then that's not a bad thing. I mean, I watched Absolutely. Hamilton on Disney with my best friend and I thought I just never would have paid the money. I just wouldn't, you know, yeah. I have a family. I would have right. looked at the cost of that and gone, yeah, but that's like school uniform and yeah. mortgage. And so maybe that's, that's something positive to take out of it going forward. For sure. Um, and to stream it was really, um, and it, I think it cost us $20 to buy this yeah. ticket, ticket per household, you know. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so my birthday is Saturday, so we're, my, so my husband and I, yeah, we're going to watch, um, we're going to watch this play, so. Oh, yeah. that's lovely. Yeah, yeah, and hopefully he'll make dinner for me and clean up afterwards, too. <laughs> what we yeah. like, yeah. that's what we like. We don't need gifts, we need dinner and play. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we need gifts. <laughs> well, I'll tell you something funny about that, just briefly. So um, 
I, you know, obviously have like an Amazon Prime account and everyone's always coming to me and say, mom, can you order this for me on yep. Prime, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Yep. Um, and I order plenty myself on Prime. And the other day I got a notification about an order and I thought, wait, I haven't ordered something today on Amazon. <laughs> I probably did yesterday and I probably will tomorrow, but I did it today. So what is this? And I go and look, of course, because I think someone's like hacked my account mm -hmm. and um, someone has ordered and I've done a lot of jigsaw puzzles in the um, in the pandemic, you know, they've been sitting on my dining room table and I've only done like thousand one. That's the most thousand piece puzzles. Mm -hmm. And um, someone has ordered a three thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. And I, I looked at this and thought you know, what is going on? It's in my name. It's coming to my house. So obviously no one hacked it. And I'm like, oh, my husband bought this for me as a birthday gift. Oh, this 3000 piece what? jigsaw puzzle <laughs> and not even realizing that I'm going to get that notification, <laughs> you know, and can see what he bought me. So, <laughs> yeah, that is the downside. My stepmom bought my dad a CD album mm -hmm. last year. And of course, they have a shared email address. So an email <laughs> pops up saying, here's your free, you know, you get like a download version of it. Here's your download version of, and he went, what? All right. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, first world fun. problems, Stace. Right, I know, problems. I know, I know, I <laughs> know. So any other, any other stories from the book you want to tell me? Um, I don't think so at the moment but that's largely because like we've not been able to go anywhere so I wasn't able to have a launch party I mean I drank a lot of tequila good I drank a lot of <laughs> and wore yeah. my very sparkly dress all day yeah. but there's just not that much going on in any of our lives right I mean, those right. of us who are lucky enough to be well hmm. obviously yeah. um but yes I would say through my um Oh, where has it gone? Yeah. Through the distress of stupidly reading reviews, I made a fabulous new friendship. And I, oh, I know where the book is. It's under my computer. Oh, so, that's so funny. The, the woman who won my review writing competition, turns out she's a writer. Oh. Not only is she a writer, she's a published, proper published author, which nice. probably actually tells us why she was so good at writing that review. <laughs> And she sent me a message, obviously I had to get her address to send her the, the big prize. And um, she wrote back and said, I just, I love your book. And I get, you know, I read so much stuff and so much of it is just the samey, samey. And this just made me so happy. And I looked her up and I was like, wait a second, you've got like three books published. And she went, oh yeah. And do you know what? don't read your reviews oh, and we started having this lovely back and forth where she was saying when I got my first book published I was so excited and it was just the best thing that had ever happened to me and then it came out <laughs> and, yeah, and as we said most people loved it but the people who don't love it oh they want to tell you and they want to so nasty be about loud. it yes. anyway this is her name Brie Barton and she's oh. written this brilliant fantasy trilogy of books this is book number two tears of frost wow. first one is heart of thorns i think anyway so i ordered her book to reciprocate yeah. it's nice. just wonderful it's kind of feminist ass kicking fantasy novels oh, and they're gosh. really really good and really beautiful and that really turned it around for me actually i thought okay so it's not just me it's not just that oh, no. you know these people hate me it's just that there's always you're always gonna piss someone off of course always. and that's okay I'm gonna tell you loud yeah, for sure for sure <laughs> so that was I, lovely she she gave me i found a real friend in her and it oh, gave me company and it made me feel so much better i can't tell you <laughs> you're gonna have all these fancy author friends now Oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> no. Well, I already do. You know, the yeah. ones I'm grateful. They're like, oh, Imogen, she's my bud. Yes. Yeah. I know. I had one other question because I yes. think you have a new tattoo. Is that the other one? Is that new? 
I, I mean, I the show it the other day. Obviously, we've been in, in like COVID for over a year, and I've not had one in that period of time. You saw yeah, my microphone. microphone. So, microphone and Art Nouveau flowers. You saw. <laughs> where is she? There she is. Yeah. I got my COVID vaccine in oh, her boob. <laughs> that's what you were showing on Instagram. Yes. Right. Um, right. Right. And yeah. that, so this is going to be my bits and bobs arm. Okay. That, do you know what that is? <laughs> no. Should I? I should know, right? Uh -huh. I don't know. So I, a couple of years ago, I got a, a life-changing job narrating some My Little Pony books. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm i that person who only just got rid of her childhood My Little Pony pillowcase because it became see-through. <laughs> I was obsessed. And when they are, I got asked to do for Europe, I don't think you can get them in the States, but I got asked to do, to read some My Little Pony books. And it was, well, this is how much it meant to me. Guess, this is yeah. Rainbow Dash's cutie mark. Uh -huh. <laughs> and as time goes by, like, you know, I thought I might get something to symbolize getting my book published, if my film yeah. gets made, I'll get something else there. Um, and I have seams up the back of my legs as well. Oh, cool which was an homage to burlesque. And they have yeah. little rockabilly swallows pulling the seams up at the tops of my thighs. Oh, cute. So, yeah. so what did you call that arm? What's that arm, your bits and... My bits and pieces arm. Oh, bits and pieces arm. It started out just with her. Yes. But then I wanted to get this and I thought, well, this one, it obviously is its own piece. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, here will be where I get my little kind of mementos and yeah. ideas. Yeah. Lovely. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Imogen. It was so lovely to talk to you and see you again. And, um, you know, I love that we've connected and that, you know, um, you're just a lovely person. So I really enjoy oh, having oh, you as my friend. And, you know, um, <laughs> I'm just so glad you're still doing this. It's brilliant. Well done, I'm so, you. I'm so glad I'm still doing it too. <laughs> So, and you know, so doing video now is like the, you know, I'm probably, a, you know, a little late on the draw here, but you know, thing, doing video is a real thing now. So, um, I'm hoping that will catapult me into the next <laughs> level of podcasting and whatever they call this, but, um, yeah, so it's been a lot, of, it's been a lot of fun. Good. So. You take care and I look forward mm -hmm. to what whatever comes out next for you. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I really had a lot of fun. You can find the Shit That Happens to Me podcast everywhere you listen to podcasts. And remember, don't be a crumb.